And the truth is, once again, the world has changed and you cannot wait. Because if you wait, effectively what happens is you lose out on where the world used to be. Uh, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. And welcome to Our Cloud University. This is a technical session. It's an educational session for investors that are looking to get more um, cluey on how to make these good investments. As you're going to see throughout the course of the day, there are some amazing companies outside, some amazing companies that you're going to get exposure to. But to make a smart investment really starts here. So with that, we're going to go through today's, uh, the next 45 minutes, really breaking down today's, uh, th this session into three core clusters. The one is the economic provisions of making an adventure investment. The second is the control provisions. And then finally, just some general strategies that some of the best venture investors make around portfolio diversification. Um, and I'll explain to you what the J-curve means as well. Uh, having said that, I do want this to be a very, very uh, informal session. If you have questions, please just shout them out, and let's make sure that everybody walks out of here knowing much more, not just in theory, but also hopefully in practice as well, that you could use these tools when assessing new venture investment opportunities um, and understanding some of the jargon that goes behind the term sheets. Needless to say, this is just education and not solicitation of, of funds. Um, th the question is, why are we here today? Why are we here today looking at startups, early stage companies, um, when, when really there's active markets out there, everybody could be speaking to brokers and buying into public stocks and buying into more, um, more traditional industries, more established companies, companies that have track records. Why are we looking at these very early stage companies? And the truth is the world has changed. If you go back, 20 years ago, the traditional industries really were the industries that were, were dominating the markets. Fast forward to where we are today, and that's completely changed. The entire landscape has changed, and it's really only the technology companies. Okay, And today we could add some more companies over here as well. If it's going to be Uber and Alibaba, and we work up until a couple of weeks ago, right? There's many, many more technology companies that are starting to dominate the space, and technology seems to be eating everything. And the question is why we can't then just wait for the technology companies to hit the markets. Things are going to obviously be much more clear when they're the public markets. We could buy stock at that stage. And the truth is, once again, the world has changed and you cannot wait. Because if you wait, effectively what happens is you lose out on where the world used to be. When some of the older technology companies went public, they went public after raising um, a fraction of the venture capital that we see today. The value creation for the private investors over here is seen in the orange, and the public markets still had a tremendous amount of value creation after those companies hit the markets. Fast forward to today, and what we see is a completely different picture. All the value creation, all the value creation effectively is held by the private markets, and once these companies go public, there still is value creation, but it's a fraction of the real potential that the, custom, uh, that the companies were able to generate. So these small little gray bars at the top over here, still represents two times, three times your money, which is great for a public market investor, but if you want to get 600 times, 800 times your money, it's rare, but if you want to even be in the game for that, you really need to get in early stage into these technology companies. But like I said before, we have to do it in a smart way. So the way our crowd looks at investment opportunities is through assessing these six core um, clusters of, 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 um, of a company, of the, th the thesis, and what we try to do is find a risk-adjusted return where we know that the downside is going to be mitigated as much as we can. On the other side, we also want to make sure that there's potential upside to really generate those kind of returns that I was describing before. So we spend a lot of time looking at the company traction, how the company's performing in its core markets, who it's selling to, how sticky the product is. We spend a lot of time talking about the team, who's behind it, where they've come from. We spend a lot of time looking about at the, what we call the TAM, the total addressable market. There's some investors that like to invest in niche products. That's not our model. We like to have super disruptive products that can have global domination in their markets. So we like to see that there's a tremendous addressable market. We want to make sure that the value proposition is simple enough that I can understand it, that you can understand it, and actually that the end customer can understand it, that the purchaser of the, of, of, the, of the product knows what they get in as well. If it's too complicated for us that we don't have it, that we don't have the in-house expertise, it's probably going to be something that we're not going to look at too seriously. We look at sponsorship as well. That refers to the, the co-investors in the company. Investing in venture is very much a team game. 
We don't like to be the only investors in a company. We like other people that are smarter than us to come alongside and to also justify our valuation and to justify or give credibility to our thesis and to do it together. It brings down the risk. And then finally, for this session, we make sure that the deal terms are sufficiently attractive that we know exactly what the economics and the control of the company is going to be post the investment so that we also know where the, where the potential outcome is going to be for us. So, like I said before, the three main clusters that we're going to talk about today, first is the economic provisions. But before we begin, I, I want to really just break this out and explain that anybody that has any experience in investing in public markets effectively knows that there's one consideration to have when they're investing, and that is, are they happy with the share price? That's really the only factor that you have to control to choose over. You don't get any information rights. You don't get board rights, you don't have voting rights, you don't get to you know, peel back the curtain and look behind what's going on in the company. You look to see how the market's performing. If you believe that the share price is going to go up for whatever reason, you potentially make that investment. If you think it's dropping, you might be selling, right? But that's the only consideration that you have. It's really just in the valuation of the company. Moving though to what we do, we buy preferred shares in companies. And these preferred shares have many, many more nuanced rights and, um, and um, uh, um, preferences to them, as the name denotes, that we're going to describe. And with that in background, and I want to talk about the valuation of a company. In my mind, there are effectively four different levers that can be pulled or used to balance a valuation of a company. The one, of course, is the sticker price, right? You'll see all the, the guys walking around outside, all the CEOs saying, my company's valued at $20 million, $80 million, $200 million. There's that, the sticker price, and certainly when we share deal terms on our platform with all of our investors, that of course is also very, very much featured and it's important to understand the pre-money valuation of a company. The second thing is the ESOP, which is the employee stock option plan. That's the piece of the company that the board, the shareholders, the management has effectively cornered off and given to the management team or, or really anyone in the team to incentivize them to make sure that employees have sufficient skin in the game. The third is the liquidation preference. And in terms of downside protection, when things aren't going well, that's a super, super important thing to make sure that you look out for. And then the final um, thing is to talk about is the anti-dilution protection. And anti-dilution protection, uh, we'll get to as well, gives an investor a particular level of, um, of share price adjustment in case a company has to issue shares at a cheaper price that you paid, you effectively get new shares for that. The very fact that somebody else is paying a cheaper price than you, you get protected by that. When we talk about this valuation concept, anybody that's got friends or perhaps has worked in private equity or later stage investing knows that there's very much a science behind that. You could look at discounted cash flows, you could look at projections, you could look at you know, company bookings and EBITDA. And there's a tremendous amount of, of, um, of weapons in, 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 the, uh, you know, in, in the trough there that you could be using to, to really come to a calculated valuation of how a company is trading especially when it's working in, a, um, in a, uh, a competitive landscape where there are other companies that are perhaps doing similar things or working on a similar product, you know that if a company is trading at seven times revenue multiple or three times EBITDA or whatever it is, right, you're not going to do something that's going to be drastically different because the market's going to reject, reject that. But when it comes to startups, when it comes to early stage companies, sometimes there is no revenue. So how do you assess the quality of a team? How do you put a dollar value on that? How do you put a dollar value on, on, on the thought, on the idea? How do you put a dollar value on competition and on the, perhaps the technological moat that this particular company has built for, for itself that prevents other people from coming in? So these are some of the things. So very much when we talk about evaluation of a company, it's very much a, um, a pool between these two, these two science, or between the science and the art over here. It comes with a lot of, a lot of finesse and a lot of experience. Uh, I was sitting a couple of years ago with um, a major um, VC from the Israeli landscape. We were looking at a company together, and he described this one company, and he said to me at the end of the meeting, he says, I'm not sure if that company was worth $20 million or $120 million. Okay, so even after all these years of experience, you still sometimes do have this battle on trying to understand how to value these companies. Okay, and typically what lands up happening um, is you get to a balance between how much money the company really needs to get to its next milestone, so that the capital demands of the company, and that's going to be weighed off against how much of the company the existing shareholders are prepared to sell for the new money. 
Okay, and we'll go through a couple of examples of this suitly, uh, shortly. The next thing to discuss is what I said before, the employee stock option plan. The employee stock option plan effectively is used to either retain or to attract senior talent to a company. A lot of these fledgling startups, uh, they just simply haven't got the cash resources to be able to sustain um, the type of salaries that the, the senior people, senior engineers or senior, senior anybody really would expect to get. And they know that if they leave the startup and they get poached or picked up by some of the bigger players like Amazon or Google or Facebook, uh, th there is no shortfall of cash. I mean, they don't know what to do with their cash over there, right? So they know that in order to be competitive, what they have to do is give a piece of the equity to the employees. As soon as they've done this, on the one hand, they've brought down the cash requirements that they need to actually pay in salaries. And on the other hand, they've actually um, absolutely incentivized the team by making sure that everybody has skin in the game. So if you're a founder or an early employee in a company and you get shares for a dollar a share or an option really for a dollar a share, and that company grows and grows and grows and becomes something of tremendous value, so that's really how you extract your capital. It's not going to be through the salary anyway. So many, many companies or startups, and this is something very, very important to us. Every time that we write a term sheet for a company and we describe the terms in which we're going to invest, this is something that we absolutely look at to see how much of the company's stock is actually going to be allocated to the employees as opposed to allocated um, to, the, to, the, uh, to the investors. Something that's very important. Again, it aligns interests with everybody. As if we know that the employees have skin in the game and they're incentivized to work, we certainly could sleep better at night knowing that people are working hard for the company and working, working hard for, for our capital investment. Uh, but the question is, if you're giving away a percentage of a company to the employees, somebody's giving away that, right? In other words, it, it can't be that you now have a company that has 120% of the shares. It's still going to be 100% of the shares. You've just cut the pie differently. And the question is, who, on whose account is that? Who's giving away the shares? And it just so happens that most of the time it lands up being the founders or the first investors in the company, the earlier investors in the company. And I'll go through a quick example for that. Okay, let's say over here we have a company that has a $20 million pre-money valuation. Okay, so they've come, or whatever, the industry has come, the VCs have come, and we, we've settled on the sticker price valuation, it's 20%. And we look at the cap table, the capitalization table, which is effectively a ledger of all the shareholders and option holders in the company, and we see that 10% of the company has been earmarked for the, for, for the employees. Okay, if we as an investor determine that that's not enough because 10% is only going to go so far, but we realize that there's still going to be a big slug ahead of the company and they need to employ new, new engineers and they need to have an arm in the U.S. to get into the market. And, right, for whatever, whatever reasons, we determine that the 10% isn't sufficient to incentivize the team and we require them to have a 20%, you know, a 20% ESOP plan. We have to increase that va the, the, the option pool by an additional 10%. What that effectively does is pulls down the pre-money valuation by 10%. Why? Because we take in an additional 10%, sorry, an additional 10% of the company over here. We're applying that to the 20 million pre-money valuation to make sure that we're carving out of that 20 million valuation an additional 10% for the employees. What's left is really $18 million of value that can now be ascribed back to the shareholders uh, prior to our investment. So if you think back to that drone where you've got the different propellers keeping that drone up, you have the sticker price of 20 million with the ESOP that's now played in. And that ESOP, by the way, could be a small clause on page three of the term sheet. You've effectively now completely lopsided that balance You've brought down the valuation, the effective valuation from 22 to 18, and the founders at this stage in experience are none the wiser, okay? And many, many shareholders in the company are none the wiser as well that this sometimes uh, uh, happens, and it, it's a necessary thing to happen. Okay, um, I'll share a quick story. A few years ago, we had a company in our portfolio that came to us um, thrilled. The CEO wrote a fantastic email, how happy he was. He attracted a term sheet from another investor, a great investor. Uh, the valuation of the company was higher than the valuation of the previous round. The, th the founder and CEO was thrilled because obviously this is a big up round. What he failed to appreciate, of course, was that the ESOP requirement that the new shareholder had imposed and had put into the term sheet effectively brought down the valuation and the share price that, although on paper, it certainly looked like this over here was an up round. He failed to appreciate that it was actually a down round in the company. Um, and that took a lot of you know, finesse in order to make sure that everybody was okay on how, that, on how we were able to, to converge on what made sense for financing in that particular situation. Okay, when it comes to downside uh, protection, 
the liquidation preference is really the most important and critical thing to look out for. Okay, as you know, venture is a dangerous sport. Many, many companies, the vast majority of companies, don't make it to the finish line. And th what happens then is that, effectively, when these companies are able to sell for a fraction of the value in which they previously had um, received investment at or the capital they had raised, there usually is some money left in the in the, uh, the, the you know the, the, the cash box to share out. And most of it goes to creditors, truthfully. But then, if anything is left over, or if the company was sold for a low valuation, the liquidation preference determines who gets their money first, okay? Typically would, speaking, since the investor puts the money in, they are the ones that get their first money out. That's called a liquidation preference. It's your preference to take capital off the table when a company goes through a liquidation, okay? This is a, a right that is only um, held by preferred shareholders. Common shareholders do not have this, meaning that if you invested in a public stock and that company was valued at $100 million, and then um, was sold into the private market for $10 million, you do not get to take your money off the table first. In that case, whatever you own of the company, 1%, half a percent, a fraction of a percent, you will take that money off. But if you're a preferred shareholder, you get to first take your capital off. And there's quite a few different varieties and types of preference of, of, uh, of these liquidation preferences. The first is called a non-participating preference. This is the vast majority and the most commonplace preference that we have. And that is, you get to choose. As an investor, you either get to take your money off the table, and by the way, it doesn't have to be one X your money. It could be whatever multiple you guys, you, the company, the investor agrees on at the type of the investment. It might be that you agree to two times your money or three times, but whatever it is, you get to take your multiple of money off the table. And the other option is that you get your pro rata share of the company. Okay, so if you own a percentage of the company, you could choose, and you do this calculation, how much I invested, what my pro rata share of the company will be, and then you get to make that decision on where you want to see yourself. Another type is the participating preference, not too common. Um, this over here is pretty draconian from the investor side, but effectively, if the capital markets allow for it, you as an investor first get to take your money off, and then you also get to take your share of the company, so it's almost like a double dip. Uh, and then the third vari uh, variation as well is called these capped participations where you get to do both, but only up until a particular extent. So you'll get to be able to take off your money, then to participate. But if your participation and money comes to, let's say, three times your total investment, then the company says, stop, you're now being greedy. Okay, you have to now choose at that stage what you want to take. So um, let's look over here at a quick um, example over here and how this plays out. And I credit this, I credit this example to, uh, to David Stark. Um, a friend of mine today is the um, founder of Ground Up Ventures, um, an early stage fund. So we were looking over here at two companies, uh, sorry, one company where we were trying to uh, denote a valuation a few years ago. The company came to us and they valued themselves that they were looking to raise money at $110 million pre-money valuation. They were looking to raise $15 million meaning that the post-money valuation effectively will be the aggregate of the pre-money, what the company is worth before you invest, plus your investment gets to your post-money. Had we and the cohort of investors put $15 million at a post-money of 125, as a group, we would have held 12% of the company. But we were not particularly comfortable with that valuation. We thought it was inflated. We didn't see the value of the company at that stage to be worth $110 million before we put our money in. So we demanded a 2x liquidation preference, meaning that if the company was sold for a value less than when we invested, we would effectively have the right to take back two times our money before anybody else gets their money. Okay? We then started to... So at that, with those economics, the preference, the total preference would be 30 million. We then compared and we said, well, what would happen if we drop the, front, the valuation of the company, okay, from 110 to 60 million dollars? We still give the company the 15 million dollars that it needed. The post-money valuation drops significantly, and because of that, our ownership in the company increases from 12% to 20%, by virtue of the fact we now have invested in a much lower valuation. To offset the high ownership that the investors will now have, we agreed to drop the liquidation preference from 2x to 1x. And what we found was at these particular exit values, we had at $150 million, we didn't care if we invested at the high valuation with the 2x preference, the low valuation with the, with the 1x preference, that was really our point of indifference. But any exit below $150 million, we would have actually have preferred to have invested with the, with the scenario B because the 2x preference, that preference was really going to be what was going to make our money for us. But once the company started to get really big and have you know, a potentially huge exit multiple, 
we saw that there's more value in owning the ownership of the company, having that large ownership of the company. So how that works is going to be very important. We're going to talk about the conversion rights of preferred shares um, uh, a little later. So this is the liquid predation preference. Again, just to tie that back into that picture of the drone, you have a $20 million company valuation, effectively dropped to 18 because of the, because of the, uh, the employee stock option plan. And now, if there was a high liquidation preference tied to that, it effectively also reduces the, your, your risk um, exposure because even if the company sells for $10 million, if you have a preference on that, you're very well protected. And if you have a multiple in the preference, uh, not only are you protected, you could actually be making money when the company is doing poorly. Okay? And we see this many times, by the way, within our own portfolio, within many, many funds' portfolios. There are some companies that they hit a, uh, they hit a brick wall, and investors are kind of you know, at, this, at this point now, uh, this intersection where they're trying to work out, do we let the company die or do we invest? And many times what they'll do is they'll say, fine, we're prepared to invest, but we want to have a 3x liquidation preference in the new money or a 5x liquidation preference in the new money. Meaning what? We see that the company is really challenged. They've hit a wall. We think that the risk to get over this particular hurdle is substantively high. And to make it worthwhile for us to put money in again at this time, we need to make sure that if you are able to somehow get out of this, even just slightly, and you sell the company for even just something, we at least could get back five times or three times the money on this new investment that we're going in. So this actually becomes a very, very important um, thought for investors that perhaps have money in a company from earlier stages. The companies continue to raise capital as it goes along. And um, if you feel that the company hits a wall and all your previous money effectively is wiped out or has been devalued, there is a way to recoup all of those losses if there's a high liquidation preference from the end of the new money that's coming in. The fourth um, balancing act of, the, of the, uh, the drone over there is what's called anti-dilution protection. And again, this over here is a, a clause. It's a, a pretty cumbersome clause over here that takes a bit of uh, mathematical gymnastics. But you basically reprice your shares as a function of the new price of shares that are coming into the company in the event that the new shares are sold at a, sh a lower price that you invested. So for example, if I invest in um, a company $3 a share, Six months goes by, the company hasn't hit the commercial progress that it expected, or the R&D isn't there, or the head of you know, VP marketing, lead, whatever it is, right? The company hits a wall, and they're now looking to raise money, no longer at $3 a share, but rather at $1 a share. If I have full ratchet protection, the company will come to you and say, great news, you're $3 a share, we've retroactively repriced it to $1 a share, okay? Technically, that's not the mechanism, that, but that's really the way that it works out. Technically, it's only on conversion to common stock, but put that all aside. That's just you know, the, the nuance on, the, mecha on the, the, the mechanism behind it. But effectively, they reprice your shares from $3 a share to $1 a share, meaning that you have now have three times as many shares as you anticipated, and your ownership goes up. That there's full ratchet. It's, again, pretty rare. The most, I guess, um, equitable kind and the most common kind of downside protection is what's called broad-based weighted average, which is effectively going to take the amount of shares in the company before your investment, um, during your investment that comes in, you know, during the next round, during that down round, and it kind of finds a, a happy balance. So you're not going to get repriced to $1 a share. You're also not going to be left to $3, but it will meet somewhere in the middle, not necessarily on $2. Again, it depends on how many shares and how much money has been put into the, to the company, but that certainly is a fair way to do it. And again, going back to that drone, I want to just keep pulling you back over there because it is so important not to get tied up on that sticker price valuation of a company but to really understand how all the economics play together over here, that on the one hand, you have the share price and the valuation, but you have all this other protection around you, and you have so much that's being carved out to other people, to, to, to the founders, to the, to the management team. Um, so definitely something to take into account and not just to be looking at the valuation. Most of the conversations that I have with investors um, is actually not about the, the share price or the valuation of the company. It's really about the, the rest of the economics of the investment, um, um, and and uh, the control provisions we'll get to. Putting that aside, we now have the next part of the preemptive rights, which according to Fred Wilson from Union Squares Ventures, he's you know, one of the most prolific writers on VC, he's um, a thought leader, he's, he's really you know, tier one in terms of, in terms of, in terms of uh, thought leadership. Um, a quote that he says that the most important term that anyone can negotiate for is the pro rata rights. The pro rata rights effectively is as companies continue to grow and excel and break away from the herd and they're starting to really show their wares and you know, increase in value, 
you as an early stage investor do not want to be left behind. You want to make sure that you can continuously grow in those companies, invest in those companies, at the very least maintain your ownership in them, otherwise you're going to get diluted. As the new money comes in, it's going to be taking more and more stock and you're going to be left with less. So again, we've seen what, um, what the downside looks like. Let's say you come in to, as an angel investor and you own 10% of a company and you have that $1 million liquidation preference. You invest a $1 million and you have a $1 million liquidation preference. And the company continues to raise money round after round at high and high valuations. And you get diluted. If you get diluted to now just 1% of the company from your 10%, if that company sells for $100 million, you made a $1 million, which is effectively your investment. You made nothing. You lost money because you were locked up for time. But if you had invested along the way, and at the end, you still were able to have 10% of that company, so it's really the ownership that's going to play to your advantage there. Your 10% of a $100 million opportunity is going to give you 10 times your investment of the $1 million. You need to make sure that you aren't diluted. And this becomes also pretty tricky because you're going to have a broad portfolio, many, many companies that are going to be raising money at different times and you know, throughout the course of their life. And you're going to be able to have the opportunity to invest or sit out all of these opportunities. What's so important, though, is to make sure that you could identify the companies that are really breaking away. And we're going to speak about this shortly to, to you know, find those companies that are breaking away from the herd and making sure that you're able to continuously back those companies and put more and more money to work in the companies that are really going to be the ones that are going to return your funds. Um, and, and this is really based on the premise of something that's called the power law. This over here is the perception of how venture deals work. Many, many people think you have a portfolio of many companies, many deals, and here's your returns. You're going to have one Facebook moment. You're going to have a couple of bad ones down on the curve over here. And this is the perception, right, that some do better, some do worse. But that is not the reality. The reality follows what's called the power law. And that is that the majority of the companies in your portfolio are actually going to go to zero and lose money for you. But if you just have one Facebook or just one Amazon in your portfolio, you're not going to care that you lost $500,000, $600,000, $700,000 on the tail over here because the, the return that you get from your one um, good company is really what's going to be enough to offset all the losses along the way from the others. And this is very much a diversification strategy that is super, super important to look at. Another thing to talk about is what's called convertible debt. If we leave all the equity aside for one moment and we talk about the convertible debt, this is a time where uh, investors or the company don't want to issue equity at this stage for a variety of reasons, either because it's too difficult to price it or it's too soon to where they were previously priced or they, they just need one more milestone before they could reprice at a much higher valuation. So there are many, many considerations why a company wouldn't want to be priced. And many times a VC wouldn't want to price a company either. For example, if you are the only investor, institutional investor in a company and the company comes back for more funding, it might be that, you know, at this stage, you, you don't feel like you really have a, an objective vantage to be making a new assessment of the, company's, of the company's valuation. So what you would do at this stage is give a, what's called a convertible note or a convertible loan. It sits on the balance sheet and on the company's ledgers effectively like a loan. However, it has particular trigger events. And when these trigger events are hit, the loan actually converts into equity. And it converts in one of two ways, either at a discount to the next share price, so if I secure with the company a CLA that has a 20% discount and the company then goes and raises money at $5 a share, I will not get, um, pay $5 a share. My loan will convert at $4 a share. I effectively will have that 20% discount on whatever value the new investors secure. And the rationale for that is because you've used my money to effectively reach the milestone that that investor has now deemed a significant milestone and therefore they make an, a, an investment. In other words, don't use my money to increase the value of the company and then make me convert into the value, that premium value that I've actually just financed up until now. So the rationale for that is that you get the, the discount. And the other is the cap. The valuation cap effectively is coming to a company and saying, look, there is no way I will give you money if it's going to convert at a value more than $20 million. Now, here's the money. Go to whatever you need to do. If you could raise money at $50 million from another investor, take it. When my loan converts, I convert at a $20 million valuation. So it's effectively a sliding discount based on how, much, um, how high the valuation is of that next round. And what we would always do is make sure that we're going to um, negotiate to have the lower of those two. So we will always take this, the, the lower share price between the discounts and the valuation cap. 
I spoke before about the, uh, the, the liquidation preferences and comparing that to how much you own in, um, in the company in terms of ownership. So super, super important to understand that you have to have the ability to actually activate taking money off the table based on your ownership in the company, and you do that by having common stock. So like I said before, there's two kinds of company stock. You have the preferred stock and you have the common stock. They don't overlap. They work completely against each other. But this clause over here is a super, super important clause when companies sell for large amounts of money. You don't want to be stuck saying, well, you have preferred shares. You have to take your liquidation preference that's you know, tied to the preferred shares. Here's 1x your money or 2x your money, and thank you. you know, it can't work like that. You have to have the ability to also say, I'm prepared to forego all the preferred rights, converting to common, activate my piece of the company, the percentage that I own in the company, and take extract capital based on my ownership. So again, a quick um, uh, uh, numerical example over here. If you invest 5 million at a 15 million pre-money, the post-money of the company is now gonna be 20 million, okay? Um, meaning that you have 25% of the company. If you negotiate to have a one and a half X liquidation preference, and the company sells for whatever amount, you get the first one and a half X times your investment, meaning the first seven and a half million dollars goes to you. So if the company sells for seven and a half million dollars, you get everything. If the company sells for $10 million, you get seven and a half, and then everybody else, the, the rest of the shareholders, the founders, the management, they get to share the two and a half. If the company sells for three, you get the first three. So in that case, you won't recoup all your capital, but at least you get to take all the money off until you hit your preference of seven and a half. But what, get in, what gets interesting is as the valuations start to climb and the company sells with considerable capital, in this case, $40 million, you get to choose and make that assessment. Do you want to take off seven and a half million dollars, which is your preference, or would you prefer to convert all your preferred shares into common shares where you have 25% of the company based on those economics and take back a quarter of the value, take back the 10. So the conversion, um, the conversion right is particularly important. Again, this is not something that founders typically fight against. Um, most of the terms that are described now are pretty standard and the nuance really comes in negotiating the, the amount. Okay, so no founder is gonna say there is no anti-dilution. What they are gonna say is, let's work out a strategy that actually aligns our interests if it's gonna be full ratchet for maybe six months or nine months and then slip back into a broad base or whatever it is, right? So you're gonna have these kind of nuances around the, the negotiation of the actual um, uh, you know, nuances of the terms as opposed to actually having the terms. But something very important to look into. That concludes the economic provisions. I want to just take one moment to see if there's any questions on that. I know there's a ton of material, but I genuinely believe that as you folks are assessing new opportunities on our platform and you see the deal terms, it'll be super important to really understand what's going on behind the scenes. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Th that is correct. So the question, if you couldn't hear, was uh, if you as a shareholder or investor have a liquidation preference um, and that's going to take the, the totality of the outcome of, a, of an exit, why would anybody sell below that amount? A few reasons. Number one is sometimes they haven't got a choice. If the board, and as, a, as an investor, we always sit on the board, I'm going to speak about that um, in a moment, it's really the board's um, decision on whether to continue to put money into the company or not. Many times a company has accrued debt, and the only way to actually cut off all those accruing liabilities is to make sure that the company is sold and you know, to clear the books. Um, sometimes it is only, unfortunately, the only outcome. What I've seen most of the time is that even as if an investor does have, in that previous example, the seven and a half million dollar preference and the company sells for seven and a half, most of the time what would actually happen is the acquirer um, will come to the, to the board and say, listen, I'm prepared to pay seven and a half, but what I'm really buying is you're found in the CEO and the IP. I think that without the IP, there's nothing here, but without the founder that's actually running this and he's running the show, I also just don't want to buy the company. I don't want to buy the product. So what would happen is the company would come in and say, listen, we you know, kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, the seven and a half is legally earmarked for all the investors. On the other hand, if you're not going to incentivize the founder, he's going to walk. Right? So what lands up happening is like the last hour, there's always inevitably going to be um, a negotiation where the shareholders are told, listen, you're not going to get back one and a half times your money. If you want to get back anything, drop it either to one half, 
1.2, whatever it is, find some, mecha uh, some mechanism that makes sense, that's equitable to give some sort of incentive to the, to the founding team and to the management team um, to make sure that they also incentivize to, to continue with the new company. So th that's the one point I'll make. The other point is, um, even in these kind of situations, so typically speaking, you're going to have each class of shares is going to vote separately. Okay, so if you, for example, a majority of a particular class, let's say in this case over here, I was the second investor in the company, I have B shares, okay, if I might have all the B shares, but if the A shares decide to block the vote, to the, the exit, again, this is going to come up over now in the control provisions, um, that also is going to kind of derail those deals. So, so many, many times, although the, the, the founders of the company doesn't have legal leverage, they certainly do, do have commercial leverage in the transaction because they're so critical to, to that transaction reaching the, the finish line. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, that's exactly right. Um, yeah, so a preemptive right is, it, it's a right. It's not an obligation, right? So that means that as a company is raising more money, because we have preferred shares, the company is obligated to keep a percentage of the, um, of the new round for us. So let's say we have 10% of the company, they're going off to raise $10 million. Legally, the company has to come to our crowd, to the investors, and say, listen, $1 million is earmarked for you guys. Okay, you have the legal right to invest it. Now, we have the right you know, to invest or not invest. We have with the ability to make that assessment. Okay, um, so as you continue to see the company grow, and the preferences become less and less relevant, but the ownership become more and more meaningful for you and more significant to the outcome, what you really want to do is make sure you're protecting the ownership. So it's an ability to try to find those better companies in the portfolio and make sure that you're continuously um, owning you know, your piece, you're not getting diluted as the new money comes in. But going back to, the, to the, the previous comment I made, that in the real world, many, many times a new investor will come and they'll say, we want to give you $10 million. If you go back to them and say, well, 20% is earmarked for our old investors because they have preemptive rights, it could be that the new investor says, well, I'm not interested in that. I'm not prepared to own less than what I think. So if this investor comes and says, I want to do, the company needs $10 million at a pre-money, let's say, of uh, 40, so 50 million post-money, so this new investment will have 10 out of the 50, they'll have 20% of the company. If you come back to them now and say, well, I want to give some of that a big, I don't know, five out of the 10 to, to existing investors because they have preemptive rights, you effectively saying to this guy, he can only put five out of the 10 or five out of the 50 post money, that's only 10% ownership for him, he might not be interested in that. So again, it becomes this dynamic where sometimes we are told that there's a new investor coming into the company, we could push back and we could try to get allocation in the round, but the investors warned that if that's the case, they just, you know, they're not interested, they're gonna walk. So there are times in the real world that even though we have these rights, that there's going to be a negotiation or there's going to be some sort of leverage that they have that we lack or we have and they lack, whatever it is. But there's always going to be a dynamic in which it needs, we need to um, assess to see how much we actually are able to get in. But you never ever want to be frozen out, right? The way you make money in venture is not with liquidation preferences. It's, it's really through this over here. It's through that preemptive right. It's making sure that as companies grow, because companies grow exponentially, right? When they grow, they grow exponentially. And when that happens, you want to make sure that you're never left behind and the trade doesn't go in without you. Yeah. So the beauty is, the question is, at what stage do you have to make that decision? You get to make that decision at the very end. In other words, when the paper comes down and you've got the term sheet, that acquisition offer in your hand, it's just very simple math to run to see, okay, if I activate the preference, I'm going to get this. If I convert to common, it's going to be that, right? So you, it's very clear to see where your economic interest is. What does become quite, um, quite interesting is that you get a lot of game theory involved because if there's multiple classes of shares and multiple investors, and some investors invested early in the seed round and they have a big percentage there, but they also invested in the later round and they have a smaller percentage with the preference, you have to try to work out what the rest of the cohort is going to do because these guys, they might have a high preference over there, but more ownership over here, and they might actually make um, you know, a, a short-term decision to leave their preference there so they could rather you know, prop up. So each fund is going to basically assess to see how as a fund they're going to get 
right, um, you know, optimize their exit. It might not be on the class level, it might be actually just be on the shareholder or the investor level as a whole. So there's a lot of game theory involved. There's, there's um, you know, tons of startups out there that are actually building um, modeling tools for these kind of cap tables and everything. Like one of the issues we find in our crowd is that there's a ton of mistakes in the calculations when they're done manually through Excel. And you know, we make sure that you know, we try to catch those. As it happens, we could optimize for our investors. Um, it's just complicated math. But yeah, you get to choose right at the end to see where you want to be. OK, um, I want to talk briefly about the control provisions as well. Once you put all the economics aside, you kind of know how much you've invested, what you own of the company, what scenarios are going to be when you exit the company. What you don't have yet is who actually manages the company, who's calling the shots. Okay, and this over here is the control provisions. By no means think that the control provisions on page five, six, and seven of a term sheet are less important than the economic provisions on page one, two, and three of the term sheet. Okay, this is super, super critical. The control provisions effectively, um, this is what they do. They eliminate any ambiguity of the roles, responsibilities, controls, rules of engagement um, before they actually occur. Okay, because when something occurs, when there's an issue in the company, at that stage, you want to make sure that you legally already have agreed to things and you're already able to pull out that piece of paper from the pocket. Otherwise, everything just basically falls to pieces. There's going to be tremendous amount of ego involved. There's tremendous amount of money involved. There's tremendous amount of, of uh, you know, um, reputation involved and, and risk involved, both on the founder side and the investor side. Uh, if you look to see now you know, a, a live example with SoftBank and, and their continued involvement in WeWork because they are, are so embedded over there and their name is all over that, they can't just let that thing fall, right? So you, you have situations where a firm's reputation and brand is very much tied into the success of its underlying companies. Um, so, board participation, okay, the board is effectively responsible for placing management, including the CEO of the company. Now, our crowd has done on a few occasions, it had the very difficult task of having to replace a CEO that's, you know, um, brought a company, sometimes from inception, if it's the founder CEO, all the way to where it is, but if we could see that that's no longer the right person for the job, we have to make that difficult decision on the board level to find somebody, to replace somebody. We always try to do this with the CEO in mind and have an open dialogue and making sure they understand our intentions and what we headed out to do. Um, we've never seen any example outside of our portfolio where there's been success where, you know, you kind of do it behind the CEO's back. We want to make sure that it's as transparent as possible. Uh, information rights is also critically important for us as shareholders. When we make an investment in the company, every single one of our companies gets a financial form that they're obligated to return to us within 15 days of the every, uh, at the end of every quarter, including their headcount, their cash balance, their burn, what their capex, opex was, what their projections are. And that's a tool for us to be able to assess um, how the company is performing. So when they do raise more money, we can make an educated thesis about whether or not we're going to come down heavy and participate with more than our prorata if we can in an oncoming round so we could increase our ownership in the company or if we're going to um, you know step out of it and not participate so that's something that's very very important uh, if there are any investors in the room our crowd investors I presume there are you would know that this is information that you do not see Okay, you guys unfortunately are not privy to it, and the reason for that is because we are very proud of the fact that today we have close to 45,000 investors in our platform. Uh, some of you we know are direct competitors of our startups. Uh, some of you we know do not have our startups interest in, in heart, but you have other interests, and that's fine. Uh, we cannot share some of this information. This stays either at board level, at the GP level, and we can make, um, you know, um, Certainly not recommendations, but we could certainly um, inform on what our thesis is about a company. Okay, uh, I didn't speak about a right of first refusal. Um, as, as an investor, you also have the, op uh, the opportunity sometimes to make acquisitions or to buy product, to distribute product, to make investments in the companies or whatever it is before other people have the choice to do that. So if you're already embedded in the company, let's say, and you have 10% of the company, the company needs more money, sometimes you would have the right to first refusal, the right to be the first offerer to come to the company to say, I want to grow my, my position in the company. Before you go take money from that fund, I'm prepared to give you the money. Right? In other words, all else being equal, you sometimes have the right to, to participate um, before others do as well. 
And then again, protective provisions. Um, these are many, many control provisions that as a shareholder, you're going to want to make sure exist to make sure that the rest of the team and the company is very much aligned with your interest. Okay? Uh, you don't want to be in a situation that you invest money into a company and three days later, the founder sells all of his shares to somebody else. At that stage, he's completely unincentivized. It's very clear that he has no interest in the longevity of the company or the growth of the company. And this is just after you've put money into it. So you want to make sure that you have aligned interests. So some of these control provisions will be to prevent a founder selling shares. It could be to prevent a founder from employing particular people in a company or going down a particular market. Um, many, many provisions that make sure that before you put money into the company, when you have the most leverage, that's really where you try iron out all of these potential issues. Okay, and finally, I want to talk about um, portfolio structure. Okay, this over here was a, a Monte Carlo simulation that was done over many, many investments over many, many years. And what they found is that this game of venture investing is, on the one hand, very, very dangerous, okay? Uh, on the other hand, it could be particularly rewarding if you hit those right companies, but you need to make sure that you diversify broadly enough to make sure that you actually do have a Facebook or a WhatsApp or a Google in your portfolio. Because if you don't have those companies, you really do miss out. So what our crowd has done is a few things. Number one, we've generated quite a few funds, a couple of funds that are index funds or they are they're broad-based diversity funds where you get to invest um, within one vehicle, within one our crowd fund, but that automatically diversifies you. But if you're not doing that, best practice certainly does show that investing in multiple companies is a better way to go. Um, and what we found also is that some of the most outstanding funds, some of the best funds in the world, actually have a huge percentage of their companies, sometimes the majority of the companies, that are actually losing money for them. But again, if you just have that one company, so this is not something to be scared of, it's just something to be very much aware of. Uh, and don't take my word for it. Again, this over here is from, from Fred Wilson before. If you have one investment, you're going to lose everything. Two investments, you're again probably going to lose everything. Once you get to five, you might get your money back. But really, if you get to 10 investments, that's when you start to potentially on the aggregate start to show. So uh, again, be very mindful of this. Make sure that if you are going to start getting into this asset class, do it wisely. Um, and diversification is certainly part of that game. And the last thing to mention over here is what's called the J-curve. Typically what happens is that when you make these venture investments, your better companies take longer to grow. The worst companies, the ones that can't raise capital, they quickly suffer, okay? They are unable to continue operations. They're the ones that are either impaired or written off earlier. It is very, very standard in the venture capital um, world to see that your bad companies, the dogs in the portfolio, start to show their faces first. These are the companies that get impaired and get written off. But the better companies that John was describing earlier that take maybe 7 or 10 or 12 years to shine, these are the companies that are actually only going to be showing over here at the end of the vintage, the end of the lifestyle of a fund. What's very important is that when you are in this over here, to appreciate and acknowledge that it's pretty normal. Okay, It's not nice to be there. And when you're looking at your quarterly report, perhaps at the beginning of the vintage, and you see that your 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 um, your um, your portfolio isn't performing, it's to appreciate that it might not be performing at this stage on paper, but it could be one or two term sheets away from hitting that break-even point and then actually showing, showing pro, um, uh, you know, positive returns over there. It's something to be mindful of. Um, so to summarize the session, we have over here a few things. Number one is that the valuation um, is one small component. The sticker price is a very, very small component when looking at the holistic economics of, of a term sheet. Don't look at it in a vacuum and don't get stuck in it. The second thing is that diversification is incredibly important. Don't go into one company. If you are, the chances are you're going to lose money on that. It is a long-term, long-capital, patient game. You have to appreciate that this over here is not quick returns and you don't usually have the ability to get liquidity until a company actually exits. And finally, make sure that you're looking for your follow-on rounds, the better rounds, the better companies that are out there. I want to also take a moment now just to give a shout out over here to, uh, to um, an organization called Innovation. Innovation is now partnered with our crowd, and we are working together with the business school at Hebrew University, one of the top 100 universities uh, in the world. And we are now starting this new program called University Next Generation, our crowd University Next Generation, where we are going to be working with the university and putting together our first course starting at the beginning of next year. 
where it's going to be a 12-week course that is actually going to be given university credits for students that are taking this course in entrepreneurship, in business, and it's going to be a fantastic course where you're going to really be able to get hands-on experience talking to some of the best startups up there, listening to some of the most um, interactive uh, thought leaders in the space, and we encourage anybody that's out there that's looking to see how to make some of this venture investing more real for themselves and for their families to consider sharing um, this opportunity either with children or grandchildren um, who will be able to really uh, benefit significantly from a course uh, like this over here from uh, you know Innovation, our crowd and Hebrew University. I thank you all very, very much. Pardon? I beg your pardon. Thank you. 12 days, a 12-day course, not a 12-week course. Um, what, what's coming up over here in the next, uh, in the next sessions? So if we could go back to this, thank you over here. Uh, we're going to be listening to three um, keynote speakers over here on this stage over here from KPMG, Stiefel, and Lip Ventures, a, a boutique invest, um, uh, venture capital fund. Uh, talking about their strategies and how they approach investment. And then finally, in the latest panel, we're going to be talking about the dark art of valuation and going back to those sticker prices in some of the companies that don't have revenue, talking again to some of the better venture capital um, companies out there and the funds from General Catalyst all the way up to uh, Fortissimo, which is a late-stage PE fund. Thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.